Yo, what's up, people? What's up, people? What's up, people? It is your boy, MM2K of PNTS Network. Hard Knock Digital Culture, where you're at right now. CGTV, Cloud Dosage, MM2K Gaming, Nabisco. No, I'm 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 part of everything. And shout out to my homies, the broadband bullies. You know what I'm saying? I'm still working on trying to make a show. <laughs> if I can stay up because I got to get up early in the morning and, and uh, thank you everybody for, for joining us for today. This is a uh, PlayStation pep rally. Not like the PlayStation really needs a pep rally, but I wanted to send a signal out to all my fellow PlayStation gamers that, hey, this is the place to go, baby. This is the place to go to celebrate the, the prior week in PlayStation goodness and greatness. And as a matter of fact, this is just part of a trifecta in doing so. Uh, we do the show. Then about like 30 minutes later to an hour later, we do a Let's Play stream here on this channel. And then we hit on over to MM2K Gaming on YouTube and we do a game stream. So for those of you that follow me on Twitter, I always make up, mix up Twitch and Twitter. For those of you that follow me on Twitter, um, you saw the schedule. You saw that I had to revise it because we wasn't going to make it on time. Crazy thing about it today was, see, just for those of you that are not familiar with my content or don't follow me on a regular basis, I get up at 4 a.m. every day because I work from home. And I, 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 I do have it good as far as working from home. All I have to do is literally get up log in pull down some reports pull them into my database let the database run do its thing i i, I qa it and post it where i need to post it and i'm done takes about two hours every day um during our bigger weeks or run weeks as we call them my days are a lot more um, cumbersome. You know what I'm saying? So it requires me to what I do is um, I'll do my regular two hours, do my thing here, or do whatever I got to do, then come back um, like around, I'm going to say around three uh, o'clock and finish it up for the day. It takes about another two to three hours for throughout like our run weeks. You know what I'm saying? That's why I make it a habit to not be live past 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time because that keeps me on the schedule for when we have our run weeks where it's going to take me more than two hours a day to do what I need to do. Uh, so I'm up early. I'm actually up at 3.30 because I couldn't go to sleep for some reason. Um, watched a little bit of TV. Got my wife up. Got her out the hell out of the house. Started doing my work. Got done with that early. Um, my reports were actually out there early and I was nervous like oh it's just everything did everything extract here everything was there um random did my thing got in the shower and start prepping for this show I started prepping at this for this show I want to say around seven o'clock this morning that's three and a half hours from now and I still was late. <laughs> <laughs> this content creation thing man it's not it's not simple there's always some it, it went from mics not working i had to get a new mic to i couldn't find a core i mean it's just crazy stuff man so the reason why i said that is look man hook your brother up you see them bits over there hit up, hit me up with a bit or something like that or become a member uh become a subscriber you get fantastic content that reminds me i gotta uh take something off of uh patreon matter of fact let's do that right now because i gave everybody like a 24-hour preview of something and that 24-hour preview period is over but what i did is <laughs> i allowed people to see um some of the great content that we have out there on um pnts patreon or if you become a member all that stuff so let's see here. Patreon select a tier. Yep. There we go. All right. Now it's now it's over. All right. 
It was good while it lasted. We had a fantastic um, podcast talking about the zealotry in the gaming world, why it needs to stop, particularly in regards to this PlayStation S. We need to get together and make sure that everybody works so gaming can get better. It doesn't matter if you're an Xbox zealot, a PlayStation enthusiast. It doesn't matter. Like one thing, one thing that I started to admire about PlayStation gamers is that they will they will cap but they will cap for the benefit of their platform. Like if they feel like that their platform is on top or something benefits the platform, they're gonna cap for it as long as it doesn't hurt them. Once they feel like it hurts them, oh my, they will call for public public executions, (laughs) all types of stuff. Jim Ryan, they don't care. It doesn't matter. Anybody is a target. But with the other side, it seems like that all this zealotry is not based upon the well-being of the platform, but based upon um, accommodating the, the the visions of an executive, one particular executive that loves to get out there and put his two fingers together as he talks and wears the tight limbo shirts. Everything is is based upon protecting him. You know what I'm saying? Um, it is not for the betterment of the platform. And then it's just a bunch of people that hate PlayStation as well. So that's why we, we try to create these safe havens like this. Shout out to my brother, Cold Blood Sensei, in the house. I see you, brother. Let me see. We, we got to let the, the one word. There we go. Let the one word. Greetings. Salutations come out. We got our brother, Cold Blood. We got a great show for you today. All right. Uh, so let's get right into it. But that was my morning. Welcome to the PlayStation Enthusiast Podcast titled PlayStation Pep Rally. This is where we talk about all things PlayStation. Today, we have an exciting lineup of topics to discuss, my friends. Um, we're going to start these assigned topics. Bear with me here. This is the reason why I'm using that word. These assigned topics I'm going to start them off by discussing PlayStation being right to fear Microsoft releasing a buggy slash inferior version of Call of Duty on PlayStation if they're allowed to acquire Activision. Then we'll deep dive into how PlayStation beat the Switch in Japan and how they're dominating Xbox in Europe and UK. And then finally, we're going to talk about the benefits of the latest PlayStation update. But before we get into all that, I have a special rant. Okay. I got to take Cold Blood Sensei's thing off of here. I got a special rant. Um, and this rant that I'm about to do is about Forspoken, the video game. Having lackluster sales per, I guess, a earnings report with Square Enix or something like that. And I see zealots celebrating this now again there are people that had their things to say about the game and they really aren't zealots they just it just didn't entertain them enough or it it, it didn't interest them to go pick it up they're like yeah you know like i even talked to playstation gamers who felt that way like um one staunch uh playstation podcast person who was like like bleed blue to the death said, nah, I'm going to wait on that one. Hogwarts Legacy is coming out pimping. I'm waiting on that one. It was like, okay. And I was trying to explain the why. I was like, nah, man, if you're listening to the to, to the reviews and stuff like that, and, and so and so, no, 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 you don't get it. I'm waiting on that one. <laughs> so I said, okay, I got you. I got you. All right, cool. I'm not talking about or, you know, anybody else that just saw the game and it didn't interest them, I'm fine. They're not trying to draw battle lines. They just got their feelings about the game. That's fine. Um, but the zealots that are trying to think that Forspoken is some great uh, console war fodder, they have the audacity to bring it up again. And I'm going to explain to them why they want to be a thousand percent shut in the mouth about Forspoken. But before we do that, 
Another supporter, our good brother, Sean. Seanathan, 87 in the house. He says, yo, good to see you, good brother. <laughs> so let's get into it. All right. So we got a lot of content to go over today. And then I want to get to these game streams. Um, the game did not reach aspirations. And that is Forspoken. And we all knew that. Everybody knew that. Whether you were a fanboy of another console, a zealot for PlayStation, it, from any extreme, we knew that the game didn't reach aspirations. We talked about it here multiple times. Shout out to my good brother, Daryl Smog Jr., co-host of NRO Podcast. When we talked about it, we said, look, man, we know the game may have not sold as much as they wanted it to. But it wasn't a complete and total flop. Like it, 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 it didn't sell like five copies. People enjoyed it. It did receive damage because of certain things, but people bought it and enjoyed it. And it has, you know, somewhat of a respectable placing. And we'll get into all that. Um, but the game did not reach aspirations. It was to be a next the next big ticket IP, and it didn't it didn't reach that. Now, again, I'm not Square Enix the company. I'm talking about as far as a gamer. As far as a gamer, it, it despite everything that happened around it, it got respectable reach so far. Or I'll, I'll say all the way up until January, it got respectable reach. We also talked about post January, you know, in culmination with with the reception that it got from the from the journos and the fact that Hogwarts Legacy was coming out. We said, okay, it's going to chart this month. I don't know if it's going to chart next month. So we 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 knew what the fate was for this thing, the immediate fate. Didn't reach aspirations, but it wasn't as dire or horrible as people were trying to make it out to be for on, on the gaming front it was respect you know during its launch cycle it was was respectable especially because they charted on npd but that metacritic of 64 killed it all right it well, killed i don't want to say kill it in totality but it killed any aspirations of this thing being like a breakout hit no and an aggregate review like that on a video game nowadays is a death sentence normally. Normally it's a death sentence. That said, the game is a lot better than journalists tried to make it out to be. And proof of that is still the fact that it's still charted top 10, top 10, not just in the 20, top 10 NPD. And only a few months after release, it even beat God of War Ragnarok. That's respectable. For that period. While the game, now this is where things start getting off, falling off the hinges and where the zealots really start moving the goalposts because they said and did something stupid and got egg on their face. So now they're trying to extend this longer to try to get some type of W. Now, the thing that made this whole discussion foolish in the first place and why we even talked about it here is the game was being compared in sales for some idiotic reason to Hi-Fi Rush. And when the dust settled for that time period that the comparison was being made, Hi-Fi Rush didn't even chart. And it was the zealots that started living off of and even jump started that comparison not playstation fans there was a little memes of um forespoken and with the degraded physical uh, attributions and then people were talking about the, the 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 convo in the game which that was overblown you know what i'm saying that was the zealous that did that and they thought the icing on the cake or the cherry on top was going to be high five rush they went to Steam and they were like, oh, it's out selling Forspoken. Ah, Forspoken is a joke, right? 
not taking into consideration, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That when the dust settled, and I said this to somebody in the DM, because they were spouting about this. I said, I'm going to see you during NPD. And they quickly shut up because they realized, oh, snap. I said, I'm going to see you during NPD. Let's see what you got to say during NPD. And they shut up about it. But while other people were still going on. And here's what the zealots don't understand. Even though there was those momentary periods where it did well on Steam, but yet it didn't place overall on NPD, you can't use the excuse, well, it, well, because of Game Pass, that makes no sense. Here's why it doesn't make any sense. First and foremost, if you were basing the, your argument on Steam sales, when you look at the Steam community and you go by the Steam survey of hardware components, there are way more eligible Steam gamers that have the components, the GPU, whatever, that can play Hi-Fi Rush than there are that were able to play, that have the specs that could play Forspoken. So the fact that Forspoken is less than half the price and it's obtainable by more people on Steam and, it was, and then on top of that, it was critically acclaimed everywhere you went. It should have blew Forspoken out of the water. If Forspoken was going to chart, then so should have Hi-Fi Rush. It didn't necessarily have to beat Forspoken because we get it, it's, it's half the price. And Game Pass can be a factor. But if you were going to use Steam as a litmus to prove why this game was better than that game so much far better then there should have been enough momentum via steam because of the community there because of the people and what they have in their hardware uh, due to the surveys that we that are made public there were way more people eligible to play that game on steam they can play for spoken and that's and, and, and high five rush is right up their alley. A cheap double A game, you know what I'm saying? That doesn't require a lot of resources. That's critically acclaimed. It should have sold a gazillion copies. But not only did it not sell a gazillion copies, not only did it not sell enough copies to even chart because it's on Steam. This wasn't a game that was just a PlayStation uh, 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 Xbox Game Pass exclusive. It was on Steam. So not only did it not chart, right? It didn't chart beyond the miserable, right? Forspoken is miserable. If Forspoken is miserable and your game is available on a platform with a kabillion PC players, and it's more obtainable by that kabillion PC player community. And if the miserable Forspoken can chart, the dog crap game that flop, if the flop Forspoken can chart, and your game can't, discussion is over. Shut it up. Game Pass has no relevancy to Steam. None. So you're critically, your game that on every single level says this should rip it up on Steam. Critically acclaimed. It's a very positive, right? 90% Metacritic or something like that, I think. Cheap. Doesn't require a lot of uh, you know, expensive hardware assets. Those are all the pillars of an extremely successful game on Steam. Just on Steam alone. It should have killed it. But, but then, here's the thing. Two things that make it even worse. Thing number one. It's still available for sale on Xbox. Even though there's Game Pass on Xbox, everybody on Xbox doesn't have Game Pass. 
And we know that, right? Because what did they tell us before the end of the year last year? Oh, uh, Game Pass, we only expect it to be 15% of our revenue. Everything went from being a Game Pass commercial, right? Every single showcase that they did went from being a Game Pass commercial to now it's only 15%. Now, we, we see some productivity out on PC, but it's only 15%. So everybody doesn't have Game Pass, but this is, this is the actual cherry on top why for spoken needs to never be mentioned by any Xbox zealot ever in life. With all that open accessibility on Steam and the fact that there is 20, what, 25, maybe even 30 million Xbox Game Pass gamers. Only 2 million people have played the game or tried the game. I don't want to say play. They've tried. Two million people have pinged the game. That, now, now you can make the argument, well, MM2K, it's not going to chart NPD because it's only half the price, which is bullpucket. We have a lot of half price games that chart NPD, but that's neither here nor there. But Okay, fine. I'll give you that one for for the, for the sake of this. Still, with all that access, part of a game subscription that has thirty million consumers out on PC, with all the bells and whistles checked, that that, that screams Uber success. Only two million people <laughs> pinged the service to try the game. What? What? Come on, y'all. We got y'all. Got to stop the cat. Y'all really. Y'all, I mean, y'all. Y'all go through haymakers and then end up punching yourselves in the neck. That's how silly it's getting out here. Like, stop it and shut up. There's nothing for zealots to celebrate with this. All right. So really, in hindsight, even with the significant challenges, Metacritic being low, Hogwarts coming out close to release, etc. A good number of PlayStation gamers have it in their, excuse me, in their possession, have in their possession another quality AAA game. This is why the competition gets a bunch of bargain bin versions of games available elsewhere. <coughs> Common Heart performing better on PlayStation, <laughs> even though you got the marketing rights. <laughs> I can look, 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 look. At the end of the day, this is why this conversation is silly, and, and and this is like this is like talking to a bunch of middle schoolers at this point in time. But we, you know, we'll do it for the sake of entertainment. But at the, but real in reality, I commend Sony for working with Square to take a risk and put this title forth. Again, this is a solid action RPG as a result. Is it perfect? No, no. Was it deserving of some of the criticisms, particularly with performance? Oh yeah, absolutely. But ultimately what you have here is a full price game that isn't a 90 plus banger from Sony. So the response is, oh, this is trash. See, Sony, please adopt Game Pass day and date model. That's all this is. This is not a 64 Metacritic game, but that's what they do to Sony titles. When Sony titles are not 90 plus bangers, oh man, well, I came here for the 90 plus banger. This isn't it. Well, it's an 80 or 77, but I'm taking off 10 more points. That's what they do. And they do it even more prevalently now because they want these games day and date and PlayStation Plus. And it ain't happening. Shout out to the chat. I see you proper's place in the house. My good brother, 
Thank you for the support as always, man. I'm going to get to y'all in a little bit. The rest of y'all in a little bit, man. That's, that's my brother Proper's place, man. I had to, you know, I had to shout him out. But again, I commend Sony for doing that. I commend Sony for working, taking the risk, working with Square to try to bring home another AAA, you know, stellar title to the midst. And again, this is a time exclusive. So Sony is funding a game that isn't necessarily just for them. It's, it eventually is going to be for everybody. It's something that maybe everybody can enjoy. And maybe even next time around, it won't be a timed exclusive. So they're trying to put stuff in the ethos that people will enjoy even across the board. Damn, doesn't that sound familiar? Who used to do that? We'll get into that in a little bit too. But Sony refuses to do the day and date model, rightfully so. PlayStation is still investing with partners to take risks and experiment bringing the next big title. They know that every game won't land a 10. They've said so before. Oh, they said so before. No, PlayStation think that everything is everything has to be a banger out of PlayStation. No, no, you're lying. What are you talking about, MM2K? What is it? Shuhei Yoshida, only four out of ten PlayStation games make money, but Sony will always support talent. Always support talent. Direct quote from Yoshida. He says, when you look at what we do managing studios and managing funds, that's essentially what we do to look for talent and support talent. Because at the end of the day, it's the people that create amazing things and it's creative team that makes breakthroughs. It's a hit driven business. We look at our financial results of the titles and probably three out of four uh, of 10 make money and maybe one or two make all the money to cover the cost of the other titles so we have to be able to maintain that hit ratio at a certain level to be able to continue in the business in the business so we always try to find out the support and help grow the talent that's the most important work that i believe myself and some uh, and my management team at worldwide studios are doing Kudos. We know uh, that G God of War Ragnarok is going to kill it. We know Marvel Spider-Man is going to kill it. And we know that they may have slow starts, but eventually Horizon Forbidden West and Gran Turismo, they're going to kill it too. It's going to bring us a lot of money. Let's take some of that money and invest it back into new talent, Luminos Studios or whatever, to see if we can help inspire more great games because that's what we're about. Great games. This is not bargain bin society over here. We're about great games and we're going to take risks to bring those great games. That sounds familiar, don't it? It, it? You know what? As a matter of fact, if you really think about it, that's what Xbox used to do when they were good. Back in the 360 era, they used to, that's what they did all the time. An OG era. Jade Empire, Armed and Dangerous, Knights of the Old Republic, Mass Effect, Bioshock, Fallout. All of those are games that whether they were exclusive, timed exclusive, or multi-plat day one, those are games that Xbox funded, not just for the betterment of their console, but for the betterment of gaming altogether. And those games have, have shifted and morphed gaming into what we know it as now as far as Western development is concerned. You have Xbox to think for that. But they did it because they made risks. They took risks. They took risks to come up with stellar things and everything didn't land well, critically. Some things were trash, but there were some things that were different, were unique. But this siloed journo society that we're dealing with, we had to deal with them back then. And you know what? 
as I looked into this, I, I was thinking to myself, for spoken, as good as it is, despite its issues, as good as it is, it reminds me of another great game that didn't get us due because we're too in tune to listening to the journos before we get things in our hands ourselves. And I get it. Who wants to buy a game and not be able to immediately return it if you don't like it, right? Who wants to take that risk when the journos is telling you, just, just wait till it hits Game Pass and pay $15 just to experience it for the, for, for the uh, country and buffet type of experience, right? But when you do it the former way, you get better games as a result. Let me give you an example of the Forspoken of the 360 era. It was a little known game called this. This is what Forspoken reminds me of, Too Human. Two Human was a game that under the same, that pretty much they said the same exact thing about Two Human that they said about Forspoken. Look, the Metacritic scores are even similar. They were saying the same jar, it's, it's repetitive. It feels empty, all this other stuff. You know what I'm saying? Because it wasn't the same cookie cutter, uh, Term based RPG or the or you know the 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 um what, what was it oblivion type RPG or it wasn't cookie it wasn't a cookie cutter of the less successful title in that genre. That's how these journals operate. Once you give them something, they only want slight that they like, they only want slight variations of that. They they cannot handle extreme differences and things, and they can't they, they don't really appreciate the art. They're just people that went to school that happen to play games that are fancy with words. And they slaughtered two human the same way they slaughtered for spoken. Right? Now I'm not to say I'm not saying two human was perfect. No, I didn't. I did a review for two human. I gotta find it. I didn't think it was perfect, but it wasn't no damn 65. And a lot of people laughed at me then, like they're laughing now at a lot of us that are saying, you know, Forspoken deserves its props. Here's what ended up happening. The game didn't do well. The opportunities for a sequel were a modest. And then something, I think something else happened. I think the studio actually behind this, I think they got dissolved as well. I, I can't remember. I didn't, Silicon Knight, something happened with them as well, right? I believe, I could be wrong. And it wasn't a sequel. So what ended up happening is years later, as gamers are going through their backlog and there's like a lull in games coming out across the PlayStation 3 and uh, Xbox 360 particularly, people went back and played this game. And after they went back to play the game, here's just some of the things that they had to say. They said, hold up. This game actually isn't bad. I enjoyed the game's storyline and characters. The graphics and the music is fantastic. The game has a lot of replay value, even though the journals tried to tell you that it didn't, but I knew it had a lot of replay value because even though you went through a lot of the same levels, you did it in a powered up fashion and it just changed the whole experience for you. Things that you didn't have at the beginning before, now you had, and it just it, it just it totally changed the game in a lot of in a lot of ways. They were like, this game boasts some truly stunning environments with slick lighting effects, detailed textures, and intricate level designs. Yes, it did. It's an interesting blend of Norse mythology and sci-fi that manages to, uh, to be both familiar and unique at the same time. And the leveling and customization system is deep and engaging. This is what people said after they decided not to listen to the dumbass journos and try the game for themselves. Everybody that I know that have touched this game, they're like, you know what? It's not a 65 or it's not a 64. Is it, is it, a, is it a PlayStation banger or this, that bang? No, but it's a really good game. And I'm really glad that I got, I really had a lot of fun with it. 
I really don't know anybody that says, you know what, I had to put this down. And I'm not saying there's nobody out there, but they 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 generally enjoyed the game. And it even got to the point. Let me see if I can find this. It even got to the point to where, after the fact, post mortem, let's get all these damn advertisements out of here. Games Beat went back and wrote this article that says Too Human is the most underrated title. Um, I think this is of our generation or something like that. Let me of our of this generation. They said that. And in and in this article, the things that they brought up was the fact that uh the author believed that Too Human, as being one of the most underrated games of the generation was unfairly criticized by both gamers and game reviewers. Um, argue that the game's blend of Norse mythology and sci-fi is unique and interesting and that the storyline and characters are well-developed. Praises the game's leveling and customization system, which they believe is, is amazing. And acknowledges that the game did have some technical issues. What is that? Does that sound familiar? and did have some repetitive gameplay, but argues that these flaws are overstated by critics and that the game deserves more recognition than it received. Huh? And guess what, folks? The post-launch fervor for this game, after people was doing their backlog, and said, this thing really ain't that bad, was so paramount that, hold on, let me, let me just double check this while we live on here. Two human backwards compatibility Xbox. Okay, so ah, so here goes this article right here. Put it up here. I just wasn't a hundred percent sure. It wasn't one of the things that I could thoroughly research before we went live. But there was so much fervor for this game, you know, for bringing this game back. This was really a good game. Infamous game is now yours to own free of charge. The, the story of Two Human is an interesting one. The game de began development in 99, bumped around 2008, didn't come out well, whatever. But people were wanting this game so bad that Microsoft actually went back and as of 2020, a few years ago, they made this, they, they made this game free to everybody. Hopefully you claimed it. So it was added to the backwards compatibility program because of all the, you don't do that unless people really, with, with all the history behind this game, I think at some point down there, wasn't there a lawsuit or something like that um, with some of the, the assets that they used and they had to bring the game down or something happened. You don't have all this troubled history with this game. And still bring it back unless a lot of people asked about it, which proves that the journals were way off about this. And the parallels from this game are eerily similar to Forspoken. Damn, they're only one Metacritic point apart. That has me wonder. Look. Once the dust truly settled for Too Human, it wasn't a failure for gamers. Again, like I said, I'm not, I can't talk for um, the Square Enix side. I'm talking about as a gamer side. For gamers, they got a game, a quality game, a quality triple A game that they can add to their lineup and, and be thankful with, that was created, right? Once they get their hands on it. That's not a failure for gamers. I, I don't, I don't, Pocket Watch Square Enix. I want to know what I'm getting as a gamer. And as a gamer, I got another quality game because X, I mean, because PlayStation and Square Enix were willing to take that risk. And once the dust settles, I feel for this one, and gamers start looking at their backlog like how they did with Two Human, I imagine they will take a second look at Forspoken. And it will likely go through the same rigors that occurred with Two Human and say, you know what? 
I shouldn't have listened to the reviewers. This isn't a bad game. I'm glad I got it. In addition to that, Luminous's value was recognized despite the journal rhetoric. And they've been absorbed into Square instead of completely being let go. Square also said that elements of the game will be part of future titles. Will it be a sequel? Probably not. But it, it's going to help grow gaming. They've learned a lot from this game. And we got a good game out of the experiment. Unfortunately, and I feel like it could have done better. Um, but unfortunately, the, the journos had a different, <laughs> they, you know, they had a different destiny for it. And the game is still being worked on. So we still get a quality game that did release with some issues, with some flaws, but they're still working on it. And we're going to get DLC for it too. So at the end of the day, this is how I feel to the zealots. And I'm saying this to the zealots. I'm not saying this to the my, my Xbox people that may be in the chat or maybe listening to the, the VOD who were like, well, I, I'm an Xbox person and I, I really didn't, I played for Spoke and I really didn't care for it. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking about the zealots. I want to use this as an argument chip. You know, oh, it's trash and it was a failure or flop. It wasn't a failure for gamers that actually played it. Not at all. <gasps> Excuse me. So this, to, to, those, to, to that zealotry, I say this. Keep your bargain bin lukewarm titles that subscribers barely touch approach with you. Two million? When barely ping the damn game when you have all that access via pc and you had all that access via game pass and all those accolades the best you could do was two million yeah you maybe you don't gross as much money because you're less than half the price but you only got two million pings with all that access shut your ass up i and others won innovative titles brought forth by the companies that still are willing to take risks to bring forth triple a quality titles in that regards if i can use the food analogy there's one between these two that i'm talking about playstation and xbox there's one clear golden corral and there's one clear ruth chris steakhouse when we're talking these two and where I come from, we don't boast about the soggy sesame chicken over at Golden Corral, over the four-star delicatessens at Ruth Chris Steakhouse. And that's all I got to say on the matter. <laughs> Period. There's nothing else to say. Let's get to our chat. Uh, shout out to uh, y'all are killing it. Let me see. Let me put this, put this all up in here. Oh, I got to put all you. Woo. Woo. Y'all are killing it today. Hold on. Give me a second. Uh, uh. I got to put on my old man glasses to read all this. Woo, God. Let's go back here. Uh, let's see here. <laughs> Cold Blood Sensei says Hi-Fi Rush is that greatness that nobody plays beyond the tutorial <laughs> Imagine Microsoft discontinues the Xbox console How quiet all of a sudden the Twitter streets would be Hmm, it's very interesting uh, Is Forspoken better looking now? Um, I, I haven't booted it up yet a About a half an hour to an hour after this show, Ron I'm going to do a let's play here on this very same channel and we'll take a look at it. Um, I'll put it like this, bro. And I'm playing it on PlayStation 5. I think it looks good. I mean, is it the best looking? I mean, is it like Demon Souls or Horizon Forbidden West? No, but I'm playing in performance mode. I think the issue that people were having is when they try to play in quality mode, it, it, it was like sub 20 frames per second. It was horrible. You know what I'm saying? And hopefully they fix that. Hopefully you can play in quality mode, get a stable 30 frames per second and get a better looking performance mode. But even in performance mode, just go check out some of my, um, my, my, uh, tweets. I mean, not my tweets, some of my streams over at um, MM2K gaming. I did a, um, quality stream series of Forspoken in 4k in the performance mode. 
And the, what did they say it was 900p? Looked looked gorgeous. Didn't look amazing, but it looked gorgeous. So it's not a bad looking game, particularly on PlayStation 5 if you're playing in performance mode. I think if you try to play in quality mode, that's where a lot of the hiccups were. You know, that's my experience. Um, uh, Proper's placed it for Spoken. I liked it. <laughs> uh, never heard of it. Must be trash. Uh, too human? Not, no, it, it, it went through the same rigors as um, For Spoken. You really got it. Uh, really read that article, bro. I'm going I'm to put it, I'm going to send it or put it in the chat. This is a great article by R, uh, Game Beat, I think it was. Let me see if I can find it. Yeah, no, 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 no. Oh, no, no, that's that's for something else. I can't see that yet. Yeah, damn it, I can't find it. But I I, I got the link. I'll send it to you. No, it, it's, it was a good game. Was it stellar? It, it, it did something unique and different. I think what it was is that Forspoken, people were looking at Forspoken as like a God of War clone with fancier attacks. That's what they thought it was going to be. And they didn't realize that it was more like Final Fantasy ish and it wasn't like a, 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 a an, an aesthetically I, I don't how can I say this like it like it wasn't like a melee uh it wasn't a melee heavy type thing like how or, or a melee combo heavy type thing like how God of War was people were expecting God of War with different aesthetics no nah. With, with sprinkles and spritz and glitter. Nah. It's different. It's more like Final Fantasy. So I knew it when I first played the demo, what I was getting, and I enjoyed it. Uh oh, Seanathan got the eyeballs. He said, uh oh. <laughs> uh, Ron Slusher says, anything is better than day one Outriders on Stadia. Yeah, that, I mean, that was bad. That was bad. I don't, but I will be honest with you, as bad as day one Outriders was on Stadia, I don't even think it played better on xCloud. It's how bad xCloud was, but that's me. And uh, Seanathan said, that's a good way to put it. But yeah, I mean, that's it, it is what it is, bro. So all my Xbox zealots out there, cut it out. Seriously, stop it. You have nothing, <laughs> and I mean nothing, nothing, nothing. You have nothing to boast about here. And I'm not trying to knock Hi-Fi Rush. I'm just talking about the absurdity of the comparison. You have a $70 game, which is a new IP, that's $70, and it got slammed in Metacritic. So regardless of how good it may actually be, that, that's a death sentence that's out there on Steam, and it has far less reach on Steam because of the components that people have when you look at the surveys than Hi-Fi Rush would. It, for whatever it lost due to it being in Game Pass on consoles, it should have quadrupled that in sales on Steam. That is the perfect Steam game. That is the perfect Steam game that gets you all-time Steam number charting lists. And it didn't even chart the month it released. There's no discussion. Shut it up. Shut it up. All right. With that said, um, oh, proper's place. I see you, good brother. I see you with that crown, man. <laughs> You, you help him if you haven't given it out already. See, prop, prop, proper is a Twitch uh, specialist. He's probably giving away his free um, sub. If you ain't giving, if you ain't giving away your free sub yet, brother, you you hook a brother up, man. <laughs> Shout out to my good brother, proper's place. Um, let's see here. All right, let's get on to topic one, man. Topic one of today's actual show. That was my rant, but topic one of today's actual show 
is um, PlayStation, why they are right to fear Microsoft releasing a buggy inferior version of Call of Duty on PlayStation if they're allowed to acquire Activision. All right. Um, now, people may hear me say that. Sorry about that, y'all. The life of a dad. My son is having some neurological stuff going on. So, you know, we wanted to make sure he's okay at school. I thought that was him calling, but him, he was just being goofy and saying hi. Anywho, um, so, yeah. Those of you that are listening to this may have heard me talk about this prior to where I say when it comes to this whole ABK deal, I personally am not buying the whole PlayStation Call of Duty thing. Doesn't mean that I don't agree with them that this deal should be blocked, but I don't think that the whole Call of Duty thing that they're focusing on is is a viable enough excuse. I know where it would cause some harm, but I don't think it's a it's a viable enough excuse. However, Microsoft in its usual fashion put its own foot in its mouth and some things were revealed to me that made me say, oh, even though I still believe that PlayStation is kind of milking the whole reasoning thing here. Um, my thing is, damn, this is some shady stuff that Microsoft is trying to pull, right? So let's get into shady thing number one. Shady thing number one. Well, let, let, let me just break down the situation like this and then we'll get into the little shady things. Uh, recently, there has been a lot of talk about Microsoft acquiring Activision Blizzard and how that could impact the gaming industry. Now, in a lengthy document submitted to the Brazilian government, Microsoft claimed that Sony pays developers blocking rights to games off the Game Pass. Sony responded by saying that Microsoft may release a buggy, inferior version of Call of Duty on PlayStation if they're allowed to acquire Activision. As PlayStation enthusiasts listening to this podcast, this understandably is a concern because Call of Duty is one of the most popular games in the world. And we don't want to see a poor quality version of the game on our console. That concern is backed up by things Microsoft has said in the past with Bethesda's acquisition. And I'm going to get into that in a little bit. But before I get into that, I want to say this. I totally understand why there would be concerns and why Microsoft's deals that were presented to PlayStation Oh, hold on one second. Hold on. All right. The deals that Microsoft are quote unquote presenting to Sony to reconcile this. It sounds like they're bogus. I mean, I know there's a little bit of bogusness to the whole sideshow of this on, on all ends, but this is bogus. Um, so one of the things that Microsoft wanted to do was go out there and boast that, um, we're offering 10 year deals to PlayStation, um, to, to put the game on their platform and we're offering, um, deals for them to even put a dang date in PlayStation plus and what Sony revealed is that those deals, there's more than meets the eye to those deals. One in particular is that the cost that Microsoft wants in order to put Call of Duty in PlayStation Plus would cause Sony to have to raise the price of PlayStation Plus significantly. What, in, in other words, killing Killing the, the subscription service for them. Now, PlayStation Plus isn't 
at the root of of my of PlayStation's um, money basket, you know. But it's a it, it's a revenue stream. It's a, it's a um, strategized revenue stream for the future. So what Microsoft is trying to do is trying to kill it off. You take this Call of Duty deal because if not, you'll look bad with these regulators. Oh yeah, and by the way, we're going to charge you a significant amount of money that would force you to make PlayStation Plus $30 a month. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, come on. That's that's one part of it. And then I'm, I'm, I'm interested to see what the deal is that they offered PlayStation as far as keeping the game on their platform for 10 years. What's behind all that? PlayStation seems to want to take the regular professional route and keep some things close to the vest where Microsoft, they want to put all of Sony's business out on the table. They don't want to put their own business, of course, but they want to get, yeah, um, the, the, the one lady from um, Activision Blizzard come out and say, behind closed dealers, he said he doesn't want to sign a Call of Duty deal. He said he wanted to, to block the deal. Yes, of course. Apparently the Call of Duty deal is bogus to them. It's not good enough. So he's not looking at that stupid deal. He wants to, he didn't come here to sign no deal. He came to block the thing because of XYZ and how Microsoft normally does. And now with the, the help of Activision, they I, I'm pretty sure they caveated that statement a bunch. And what they're trying to do is lure Sony into then them revealing some stuff. So then now it's okay for everybody to reveal something that's closed doors. Microsoft is is so is I looked at this originally as Sony being desperate. And I still think they are desperate. But when you see these tactics that they that Microsoft is doing with trying to caveat certain characterizations of what was being said, the desperate and then them putting ads out there in the UK about what it would look like if we win this deal. The desperation is oozing out of Microsoft to get this deal done. Why? Well, they, they're not successful at managing games. Starfield has yet to release. That might change some things. It might not. Let's let the aforementioned Hi-Fi Rush. You know why we're even talking about that? We're talking about Hi-Fi Rush because the AAA offering from Bethesda, opposite of Starfield, looks so abysmal that nobody cares that it's coming out. And that's why everybody's talking about Hi-Fi Rush. Microsoft is poor at pre-examining business and saying, this is the path you need to go. This is the path you need to go. So everything is falling on this Activision Blizzard deal to, to restore Game Pass as something that could be the significant, because that's what they want. Ultimately, they want Game Pass to be the significant breadwinner because that's their easiest route. Spend money, absorb companies that are already making great games, throw the games in Game Pass, let everybody and their grandmother and their grandmother's grandmother buy Game Pass. That's the, they don't, they're not, they don't want to do things like how we talked about how they did, took the risk with two human, Maybe didn't hit the jackpot there, but hit the jackpot with other games like Mass Effect, Bioshock, Fallout. You know what I'm saying? They don't want to play that game anymore. They just want to buy. They, they want people that they know already know how to make games, and they just want to buy them and dangle them in front of everybody and not allow them to access them unless they do it through Game Pass or they beg them pretty please for a deal and charge them an extreme, extreme amount of money. But back to my other concern that I had, or that Sony has, that really makes now their concerns are justified. I didn't think that they really were. I just I thought it was their best tactic in trying to stall the deal. I think there were a bunch of other reasons that, from a business perspective, Sony didn't care about. But I think gamers should care about why this deal should happen. But now I think Sony is starting to something is starting to fall in Sony's hands. You know what I mean? All right, so. The concern again that Sony has is backed up by things Microsoft have done or have said in the past with Bethesda's acquisition. 
And our thing was they wanted a first or better approach. These are direct quotes from what they said. Let me bring them up for you. This is an article from VGC. Microsoft wants future Bethesda games. This is before the acquisition of Bethesda. They want future Bethesda games to be first or best on Xbox's CFO. Now, courtesy of this article, here are some direct quotes. Quote, what we want is we want that, that content in the long run to be either first or better or best or pick your different experience on our platforms. We will want Bethesda's content to show up the best as on our platforms. So again, I'm not announcing pulling content from platforms. The quote continues. I'm not announcing pulling content from platforms one way or the other, Stewart continued. But I suspect you'll continue to see a shift towards a first or better or best approach on our platforms. So, wow. When Mike, when Sony says, hold on. We don't trust this 10 year deal because they're going to give us the inferior version. If they even stick to that word, because this is what they said with Bethesda. And they didn't even stick to that. So when you look at it, it's like, wow. Hell no, I don't want, there's no no wonder why. Lion Ryan, I don't, I don't trust him as far as I can throw him, but lying, but he, he, he telling the truth this time. No wonder why Jim Ryan went up there and said, I'm not here to sign this deal. I'm here to block it. I'm not here to sign for college. I'm here to block this deal. You just admit it that a core strategy of yours if you're still going to put these games out there is that you're going to you're going to tamper with them or somehow something we're going to get the generic version we're going to get the walmart brand version the good sense version of the game we don't want that i think they're on to something but that's not even the worst part, y'all. What's even more troubling, just from a trusted Xbox perspective, is this quote from Stewart. I actually got that one highlighted. He says, "Yes, that's not a point. That that that's not a point about being exclusive. In other words." I'm, I'm not coming out here saying that these games are going to be exclusive. We just want them to be better or first, right? That's what he's admitting to. Or that's what he's, that's what he's trying to project right there. Now this is before the acquisition. So it's comments like these that got the act that helped get the acquisition passed. I believe. Hold on one second. However, once the acquisition passed, this is what we got. This is an article from Eurogamer where it says Phil Spencer says future Bethesda games will be exclusive to platforms where Game Pass exists. And here goes Phil Spencer's direct quote. The thing I want you to know is this is about delivering great exclusive games for you, the Xbox consumer, that ship on platforms where Game Pass exists. And that's our goal. That's why we're doing this. That's the root of this partnership. Let me let me read the, the, the full paragraph. If you're an Xbox consumer, Spencer continued, the thing I want you to know is this is about delivering great exclusive games for you. And I like how they did this. They came in like a thief in the night. The only people that benefit from a deal with Xbox is Bethesda. I mean, not Bethesda, NVIDIA. NVIDIA came in there and said, we got a, we got a problem. We ain't, we, we're not saying that the deal is bad, but we don't like 
if you can't get our support and we're made we, we we got a footprint in this community in the gaming community you want our support you got to give us something too and nah don't give us them 10 year call of duty deal nah we want your whole mother xbox lineup starting now mother so whether this activision blizzard deal goes through or not our gamers will benefit now those are some pros <laughs> those are some pros and they handled that perfectly so of course i wouldn't trust them under that eu looks like they're gonna they may be passing the deal but they still got i think cma is going to be a problem and ftc is going to be a problem and xbox is going to either have to continue to fight or just give up that's if activision which probably is unlikely but you never know what bobby kotick if activision says you know what it's it's not this is becoming too much of a drag on us we're not going to extend this like the deal had to go through by what july of 2023 or but microsoft is equally if not more egregious in their actions because they're disclosing behind door stuff to try to rally the troops they're putting out commercials in uk that's just the tip of the iceberg you know what i'm saying all this desperate stuff but they're being disingenuous in their claims of we're going to get you know we want to reach all gamers which is baloney they just bust they just put them foot their foots in their mouths with the bethesda deal and now they're trying to tell you who you're going to believe me or your lying eyes <laughs> that's what it boils down to so disingenuous especially with starfield like look here's my position i'm not one of those people that say oh man microsoft has to do this they have to put call it no if microsoft buys call of duty or whatever unless a regulator tells them that they got to do this that or the third they have every right to keep any product off anywhere it's theirs sorry i'm trying to adjust my pop filter I, from a business standpoint, wholeheartedly believe that. It's theirs. They can do whatever they want with it. I'm not one of those people that are like, oh, they have to. Uh, no, they, they, they would have won it fair and square. Here's the thing, though. Don't try. Don't again. Don't tell me who to believe me or my lying. You, you or my lying eyes. Don't sit there and make it seem like that you're Boy Scout honor of the world. We never held anything from Sony. Starfield, look, Starfield was likely going to release 2021 in its buggy state that Bethesda always does, and they patch it up later. And it was going to release on PlayStation. Various reports said the PlayStation was in the midst of doing a timed exclusive deal with the game, like how they had with Deathloop and how they had with uh, Ghostwire Tokyo. And you destroyed that deal. You let, but what's the call go through? You let the other one go through, but you felt like Starfield was too big of a get to even let that happen, because you know you would have gotten slaughtered by the place by the Xbox community. Nor do you think, nor did you think it was good to even have the game on PlayStation. This was your opportunity to get a leg up on PlayStation with Starfield. So you made it exclusive. So you you did yank that from PlayStation. You didn't yank it from them. Just be honest. You have the right to do that. Just like how Phil said himself out of his own got dag on mouth when he was talking about uh, um, Outer Worlds. He said when they bought Outer Worlds, and um, Obsidian asked him, are we still going to release the game on PlayStation? He said, yeah, I'm not in the business of taking games away from platforms. That was before it launched on PlayStation. He could have very easily said, nope, it ain't coming there either. 
So stop it. Stop it. So disingenuous. It's crazy. All right. Let's get to the chat. Hold on one. Give me one second. All right. Let's get to the chat. Y'all killing it in this chat, man. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let me let me put all these comments in here. Y'all are too much for me today. I can't take it. Uh, I'm just going to pull the trigger on it and play it on PC. Fingers crossed for GFN. Yeah, I know it's supposed to come on GFN. Um, I, Sean, I don't know what PC you got. You might want to talk to Proper about that. Proper has experience with it. He's he's, he's running to hiccups. I'm not I'm not going to front. I, I can only give you the PlayStation Five experience. I'm not going to front like it, it, it. It's cool on on PC. Even though I did hear from Digital Foundry that the problems that people were experiencing on PC were less prevalent um, on PC than they were to PlayStation Five. So that's interesting. But I, I I'm assuming that depends on what type of components you got for your pc so proper if you if you're still here swap notes with my brother so you he can get in contact with you so you can let him know what the pc experience was because i I'm, I'm not good at that and i don't, I don't want to lie to him i'm not sitting there saying that the game is perfect but um you know i i think it was a good game and it was better than this metacritic score definitely uh it's it plays amazing the problem with forspoken is it loses you you spend time collecting stuff but for what i will say that and i'm not that far in the game i will say that i didn't get the feeling of what why was i collecting stuff but the stuff that was out there in the world like it was more like resources opposed to getting the 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 slasher of medallion you know what i'm saying like you don't you don't get that feel that you're getting great armor or great weapons because of the nature of how the game works it's all about magical spells and stuff like that and you really don't get those i think there are some treasure chests where you do get some spells here and there but it's very far and few between it's not one of those rpgs and that's kind of where it might lack a little bit um, it's not one of those RPGs where you're continuously um, coming across armor and stuff and you, you know, you load up on armor and do you want to, you know, sell this or, or you know, delete that, you know, arm. No, the, the way that you upgrade your character and their magic, you, you pick up, you, you, you pick up um, things to augment that. You pick up resources to augment that, but you never pick up the spell of Rodan. You know what I'm saying? And that's where, again, like Too Human, it doesn't work like the atypical RPG. So, again, if you're one of those cookie cutter journos and you want the same cookie cutter stuff, then you, you it's going to disappoint you. Um, I got the feeling I'm used to at first wanting to come across the treasure chest and get the battle blade the battle blades of bastonia and I, and I don't get that i get a bunch of resources but what i've gotten excited about is taking those resources to the workbench and building up my character so there and there are spots where you can get special spells i'm going to continue to search for those and try to try to get those but they're very far and few between so that that is a complaint that like like they took the risk in changing the dynamic of what you're getting out in the resource world and some people enjoy it some people didn't but that's what happens when you take risks you know you try to find a new formula some of it will hit some of it won't um there is no meaning for most of the stuff you do bad thing for an rpg i, I mean i don't know like i just did a section in my most recent play um that seriously like upgraded my character so I, I don't i don't know if i got that feeling but again i can i can understand where people would get that feeling because the normal process in that action is you obtain this thing and there are not things to obtain except resources 
and we look at resources as a sub tier get from a treasure chest or when you beat a boss no i didn't get the, the flying axe of Genobla. so why did i do that you know what i'm saying like i get the psychology of that but when i when you look at the fact that it doesn't go by things but it goes by resources you understand that it kind of gives you more freedom to upgrade your character without the hassle of an inventory and that that's the word i wanted to use they they put in these rpg elements without you having to go through so much this big bloated inventory some people like that that brings meaning to players to have those things to, to go through in your cat catalog others can enjoy the experience without that bloated inventory i'm one that appreciates both i love going through things and oh man i you know i gotta empty my backpack and i mean sometimes i get annoyed when i get too much stuff but i gotta empty my backpack and what am i gonna keep what am i gonna sell i i don't mind that as far as going through resources when i got a bunch of stuff that i'm not using anymore and i can liquidate those resources or sell them or use them to create a, another big what's it called i appreciate that but i'm also somebody that hates bloated having to deal with bloated inventories so that's why i can appreciate the fact that this game operates the way that it does without an inventory uh seanathan says congrats prop and props like what what i do sean he says oh i appreciate it brother uh, okay oh yeah 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 hold up how can i forget god dang our brother proper's place got married shout out to proper's place shout out to you good brother congratulations damn i'm a hor i'm a horrible cyber friend our uh, real life yeah he said yep, it's up on the 13th this is that made me think about stadia version of eso says sean okay all right let's get to our last topic and then we're going to close out I want to talk about the benefits of the PlayStation update. And let's see if I can find, I'm pretty sure, where's the PlayStation update? Uh, hold on. Uh oh, uh -oh where's, the, where's my link for the PlayStation update? Well, I can't, I can't find it right now. Sorry, guys. Um, Damn, I just had it though. That's weird. Play station update. That is so freaking weird. There it goes. Yeah, I just I just had it. That's so freaking weird. Okay, copy link. Let's put that up there. Mm. Let's go over here to the web. Something's wrong with my. Yes, I'm going to exit. I'm going to go back in and then let's go to the web. All right. So the PlayStation blog is inside the development of the latest PlayStation 5 system software update um, where senior director uh, Sid Schumann um, went over that and uh, they did an, uh, um, did, did, they did an interview with uh, sat down with Hiromi Wakai, VP of product management based out of Tokyo. So they're talking about the update. So to summarize the update, here's uh, what it's all about. Uh, the PlayStation 5 received a significant update recently that introduced a host of new features and improvements. One of the most significant changes is the addition of 3D audio, uh, support for TV speakers, this feature uses built-in speakers for your TV to create a more immersive audio experience. Uh, additionally, hold on, did I? Let me see, hold on one second. Oh, uh, my bad. Okay. Uh, the update features... Um, The variable, it says, uh, we, we are I'm happy, very happy that we are delivering variable refresh rate support for 1440p. Um, 
and let's see here see if we can see a, get a good list of the updates that are coming it says all right update is out here it goes new social features you can join discord voice chat on your playstation 5 console you can start or re request a share screen from your friend's profile that's dope um new join game icon party new friends who played the title icon manually up get, upload game captures to playstation app and new gameplay personalization options variable refresh rate support for 1440p so if you have 1440p library i mean uh, monitors you can uh, enjoy that the game library enhancements you can now also sort and filter games when adding games to game list that's that, that is much needed uh game presets for multiplayer session preferences you can set your preference to manage who can join and who can invite other players to multiplayer sessions you've created uh playstation 4 to playstation 5 save data migration um they're making it easier for you to access your playstation 4 save data on your playstation 5 through two ways when you download or install a playstation 4 game on your playstation 5 console a notification that playstation 4 save data is available in your playstation network cloud storage will appear if your playstation 5 doesn't already have saved data for the game simply select the notification to download your saved data when you download or install of a playstation 5 game that can load playstation 4 save data such as a playstation 5 version of a game that was also released on playstation 4 the same notification will appear that's dope uh the data transfer you can now easily transfer the data on your playstation 5 uh, console including game save data 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 uh, sorry about that mic hit uh, using local Wi-Fi network or LAN cable uh, screen reader improvements uh, wireless device update for dual sense wireless control and game capture using voice command and it says US and UK limited release all right so all that stuff is is available via the newest uh update if any of you guys and gals have that update let me know what you think about it in the comment section below i have yet to try it after this this podcast i'm going to uh delete i mean not delete i'm gonna i, I gotta update I got to update the system and i gotta update the what's the called so that's why i said it might take me about 30 minutes to an hour to do so you know what I mean? But um, that's dope stuff, man. I, I like to see that. There was somebody that said to do with some cloud updates in here, but I think maybe in regards to the cloud saves, I don't think, you know, as far as cloud gaming is concerned on the PlayStation. Um, but can't wait to see what PlayStation is going to do in regards to cloud game. All right. With that said, that's it for, for the show. Um, I appreciate everybody coming through. Thank you for coming to playstation pep rally hope you enjoyed our discussion on why playstation is right to fear microsoft's call of duty deal um and then playstation killing it in japan oh oh, oh damn we did we skipped that part oh my goodness i can't believe i skipped that part i was i, I was so worked up about uh our comments <laughs> did i skip that part hold on we, we got to talk about this all right so topic two was playstation beating the switch in japan and dominating xbox in europe and uk according to recent reports playstation 5 all sold to switch in japan for the first time last month this is a significant milestone for playstation as the switch has been dominating the japanese market since its launch additionally playstation has been dominating xbox in europe and uk with the playstation 5 outselling the xbox series x by a considerable margin this is a testament again to the popularity of the playstation brand in these regions and the strength of of its exclusivity games library can't believe i forgot that so i'm glad we were able to hit you with a with a jolt of that you know what i'm saying um but yeah, now that concludes our show. All right. <laughs> and I, I'll say to that, that PlayStation's dominance doesn't seem like it's going to end anytime soon. Um, the competition 
I'm not going to say that they're going to continue to outpace the switch in Japan. That might be a back and forth. But as far as what they're doing in UK and, and in, in the States and North America, it's going to be brutal. Um, not not for the Switch, but it's going to be brutal for Xbox. Um, everyone's talking about, well, Game Pass this and Game Pass looks crazy this year. Um, in order for Game Pass to be a success, that is going to really move the needle as far as closing this gap between Xbox and PlayStation. It has to be a value to mainstream gamers, not core gamers or hardcore gamers, mainstream gamers. And until the ABK deal closes and possibly Microsoft wins that out and gets Call of Duty in there or an NBA 2K day and date, until those games are in there, you can forget about it. I've always said that. Or until Microsoft games are games that the mainstream want in mass consumption day and date. Starfield has that potential, potentiality to it, but we'll soon see. That might not be enough, might be. But until those are the games that are day and date in the, in the service, forget about it. And now you're hearing content creators, which I feel like they're getting this crap from Microsoft, which is absurd, um, you know, because there's, there's talks about the bottlenecks with the Siri S and all this other stuff. And so we, we heard from one prominent Xbox co- podcast that or, or someone part of that podcast that, hey, it's going it, it, to be different in five years. If it's going to take five years for the Xbox Series X, the world's most powerful console, to stop splitting ears with all the popular games that people want to play, then it's only going to get worse. And then in five years, with the gap being even worse, then all the rhetoric about, well, people didn't people didn't develop for the X because they didn't want to, to uh, make PlayStation mad, then that's going to be an actuality. Because PlayStation is going to be so far ahead. Why would you squeeze all the juice out of the Xbox Series X? They're not going to do it. And I think we saw something similar to that with the Xbox One X. Too little, too late. It wasn't until Rockstar said, well, screw that. We don't care. We're not beholden to anybody. Then that would be a reality. That's not the reality now, but it would be a reality then. If people have to wait five years, it's only going to get worse. Your one console now can't hang with the next generation games. The other one that's more expensive than the options that I have, than all the options that I, I mean, not all of them, but than the option that I have for, for PlayStation. What I, I'm not forsaking much, I'm not forsaking much except for a hard drive I mean, or, or, or disc bay rather. Um, now I, 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 that's more expensive, but it's splitting hairs as far as performance. No, it's going to get worse. And then it won't be a, it won't be folktale. It will be reality that then developers are going to say, well, the tools became easier, but who cares? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? This is what, this is, this is who keeping our lights on. Um, so yeah, something has to be done now and it, and it can only be done by that fan base over there. Speak it up. Stop trying to just win a a war of words on Twitter and actually demanding better. Until that happens, they're in, they have some serious problems that they're about to run into. Over here, keep holding people's feet to the fire. Keep helping gamers get access to great games. Keep it moving. What else can you say? All right, that's it for the show. I appreciate everybody for coming through. Thank you so much. Uh, we do this every Friday, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Give me about 30 minutes to an hour, and I'll make the announcements on um, Twitter and uh, Mastodon when I'm going live. Um, and we're going to play some Forspoken. All right, with that said, y'all have a wonderful gaming day. Peace.